Awesome. It's great. Give right. it one more minute. I have some announcements to make. Hmm. Where's Lockheed going now? Our uh, first virtual lecture series of 2022. Um, we're really excited for all this uh, to be moving forward. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm uh, Sean Wagoner. I'm now a president of our Central Coast chapter. I'm up in the Monterey area, and uh, uh, it's been a, a real, real treat working with our board members and uh, the folks in SLO and Santa Barbara. And um, yeah, looking forward to this year. And um, you know, doing a lot of good stuff with the chapter um, all over the chapter. So um, yeah, if anyone's in the Monterey area and uh, like me, please uh, reach out and feel free to touch base and um, we can talk about anything wildlife. And uh, we're looking forward to getting more events going on and, um, and uh, you know, more things as we transition out of COVID, hopefully. Um, who knows if the, which way the transitions will go, but that's the, uh, that's the hope. But um, yeah, a couple of quick, quick housekeeping things before we get, get to Mike. Uh, the save the date for our aquatic herps workshop will be April uh, 29th to 30th. Early registration for uh, members opens in early April. So we'll keep an eye out for an email coming from us. Um, and uh, if you're not a member yet, be sure to become a member so you can come early, uh, early, early registration. I think you get a good rate too. So, um, and all the other cool uh, perks of being a member to our chapter. Um, we're also hoping uh, Jim Lowry will be our uh, speaker for next month um, with his mammal tracking principles presentation. Um, he wasn't able to make it uh, this month, but uh, uh, we were wishing him well and um, keep an eye out for, for email on that moving forward. And other events that we're planning, uh, the return of our, of our popular riparian bird workshop, that's a development. And we're also going to host another spring birding event as well. So. Uh, just a few things in the works um, for the next few months, and we're looking forward to it. But uh, I will uh, now uh, talk about our speaker, uh, Mike Westfall. He is a well-known and well-respected ecologist uh, and wildlife biology program lead at the uh, Central Coast Field Office for the Bureau of Land Management. Tonight, he will be talking about uh, the insights into the numerous ways that mole molecular genetic techniques have been employed to inform the conservation of the blunt-nosed leopard lizard. So, Mike, thank you for joining us, and thank you for uh, um, you know, coming in and, and, and pinch hitting. And we're really looking forward to the talk. And uh, I will, uh, I'll give you give you the floor. And I will say, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and or raise your hand at the end of the talk, and we'll we'll do a a, a informal question and answer session after Mike's talk. So, um, Mike, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And uh, thanks for inviting me. We're in the talk. It's actually the first time I've, you know how, you know, we professionals, we often, uh, you know, do our, do a talk, you do it again somewhere. It's, it's useful to have that for a short turnaround. Um, but uh, <clears throat> this is something I just prepared for, for this night, actually. And uh, so it's kind of exciting for me. And we'll see how it, see how it rolls. Um, let me talk about the conservation of the blunt nose leopard lizard, um, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, I want to just give you an um, impression of what we're going to be doing in this talk for the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about my background in conservation genetics because as a, a wildlife biologist um, at an agency, at a land management agency, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> there's sometimes been eyebrows raised of what's your background. Well, I have a PhD in genetics and, and they're like, well, how, why do you need that for your job? And this is what this talks about. <laughs> It's how you can use these, these tools. Um, so uh, we're gonna go over what can gen uh, conservation genetics do and then focus in on um, Gambelia sela and uh, on what we've actually done for that species. So there's population structure. We're gonna move on to um, some innovative work we did on getting uh, DNA um, uh, out of uh, scat and actually genotyping lizards and, and uh, what we're doing with that. And then we have a captive breeding program we just kicked off uh, last year. And uh, we were really lucky to have a lot of um, good genetics work already in place and some good geneticists in place um, to make that, that work. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future. So about my background on conservation genetics, 
uh, it kind of inexorably drew me in um, before I went to uh, my, my undergraduate degree was in linguistics from Cal Berkeley. And, and then I went and was actually uh, after that was a professional wildlife biologist for a few years um, without much more uh, formal training than that. And when I started to get back into school, one of my, the first courses I took was at Sonoma State. It was uh, Derek German's first year as a, a professor there. And some of you might know Derek. And I took uh, the first time, the first time he ever taught conservation genetics, I took that course. Um, and it was a real eye opener to me about uh, the things we were, you know, that was uh, back in the late 90s. So, you know, things were still like just very new. I mean, a lot has happened in the past, uh, you know, 20 years. So um, just thought really these vistas were opening up. So that was cool. And then uh, when I went into, um, and to those of you who are students or, or looking to, to get into to genetics, um, I went back to school, did, did a year of, of post-baccalaureate study at Oregon State before starting my uh, uh, graduate work there. And I took, um, I took uh, uh, biochemistry for a year. And uh, that's a really good class to take if you really want to understand what's going on with uh, genes. And the other thing that I'm happy to have gotten when I was in grad school was a really good training in um, evolution because uh, you, know, you can uh, get into a master's program and you can do a genetics project. Uh, maybe you, you, know, you can get a cookbook, you can do the lab techniques and do all those good things. But then when it's time to sit down and evaluate, you know, is the tree that the machine giving you the right tree? And, you know, when you start to have to really figure out what's going on with your, your, your genes, um, it really helps to have that training in, in, in evolution under your belt. So um, again, seems like kind of um, arcane cane things for a uh, boots on the ground wildlife biologist for the Bureau of Line Management to have. But I hope I can demonstrate in the rest of this talk just how much, uh, a little bit of training, how far it goes in, in getting important conservation work done. Um, and I'm just gonna give a, a, just a flash of, um, since joining the BLM, a couple of these, this uh, paper on um, surf perch that I did in, in 2011, that, that was work I did as a postdoc at Kansas State. Um, but these others, you can see that I've uh, co-authored papers you know, and, and assisted these, these guys uh, on spiders, um, of course, one of those leopard lizards, um, worked with Mark, on giant kangaroo rat genetics, um, and again on on uh, on scat, and <clears throat> my favorite molecular paper is the one where I actually did all the molecular work myself in the lab, and that was on surf perch, um, which are uh, uh, near and dear to my heart and an important part of Central Coast uh, fauna. And then uh, finally, I worked with Tammy Wilbert on um, a, a important paper on the genetics of salmon king kit foxes. So. It just goes to show you that you can be an agency biologist and really kind of get your, your fingers um, dirty uh, or sterile, I guess, working in a lab or doing field work or doing whatever it takes to kind of assist in, and promote a genetic study. So what can conservation genetics do? Um, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of you have a good uh, background in, in conservation genetics and we're all wildlife biologists, um, but it might be good to do just a little quick catch up on that. So um, conservation genetics, of course, can inform uh, ancestry. So you know, here I am descended from some you know, European guy from a few hundred years ago, uh, who's descended from you know a a you know colleague of Lucy's you know from four million years ago. Um, we all go back you know to to Tlaloc or some other strange uh, fish amphibian thing that engendered all you know terrestrial vertebrates. So that's your ancestry. You can also talk uh, about your actual relatedness, you know, to living uh, organisms. And so, um, you know, I'm obviously related to, to you know, another human being. So um, genes can tell us also about ancient movement corridors and contemporary uh, gene flow. That's not glow, it's flow. And so this is a diagram of um, over time, we had the um, transverse ranges um, shift, and you can see on the left that there's a corridor there. Um, that pink arrow shows that you have individuals traveling from the, what later became the Javi up into the Central Valley, and which is what we think was actually happening when that was open. And then um, not too many millions of years ago, that uh, rotated because of tape, uh, plate tectonics, shutting off uh, the Central Valley from uh, the rest of the Mojave. And, and these are things that we can detect uh, using genetic methods. We can actually say things about uh, what happened geographically. And we also invoke the, the, the ancient geology to explain why we have this, these genetic patterns on the, on the land. And then another thing that they can do is they can guide captive breeding. Um, you take a small population of animals into a zoo, 
um, you're gonna have a restricted uh, you know, genetic diversity within that. Not, you know, that's even if you aren't already selecting from a gravely endangered population, which uh, you know, in the case of our, our leopard lizards, they were already gravely uh, you know, genetically limited by the time we, we intervened. So when you have um, a captive breeding program, and especially if you have one where you have close relatives um, potentially interbreeding, then you need to really use um, molecular genetics to, to at least um, identify alleles in the, the original population so that you can track and, and make sure that you don't have deleterious alleles or that you don't have uh, inbreeding that's likely to, to kind of expose those deleterious alleles or make them, make them build up. So going from there, um, let's go to what we actually have done on Gambelia sela, on the Molino leopard lizard, and I've alluded a little bit to um, some of that. The three main markers used with blunt nose leopard lizards are molecular uh, or mitochondrial DNA, which we call mtDNA. We've also used microsatellites and we've also done RADC. And we did all three of these in the first big paper, um, which was something innovative that, that, that John uh, Richmond and the rest of us all did was looking at all three of these markers. But since then we've used them for other applications. So just a very a uh, quick review, um, mitochondria DNA, we know that mitochondria are those um, organelles inside a cell. Uh, they're the, the power plant of the cell and they have their own genome and it's a circular genome. And uh, it's a really, really well-known ge genome. I mean, the genome of any animal is, is super duper vast, but the mitochondrial genome is really small. And so we really, I mean, it's easy to sequence the entire mitochondrian uh, genome and uh, people do it routinely now. <clears throat> but you don't really even have to do that to, to learn a lot. You, if you look at any of these colored sections on the ring on the right, those are all various loci that people use. Um, you just take that one little chunk out and you can replicate that. The nice thing about mitochondria is there's a ton of them in the cell. And so it's really easy to get at their, their DNA. Um, there's some caveats, you know, because they're organelles, uh, they're kind of highly conserved and, and they, they don't evolve very quickly. So they're used, you know, useful for deeper studies, um, but they can vary a lot uh, within populations and among populations. So they can actually be used to kind of learn more contemporary things about, you know, whether you have a, a, a species that's a subdivided, for instance, into different populations. So if you look down at the bottom at, at some of those orange ones, uh, will, you know, if you look at uh, you know COX three or any of those, we those are things that are often used um, for for molecular studies. Uh, so there's also a, a completely different form of marker that we can use, which is the, in the the nucleus of a cell, which is um, parts of the, the nuclear DNA that we call microsatellites. Uh, for some reason, uh, that's lost in time. But another good name for them is uh, tandem repeats. And so in this case, we have a, a region in a genome where it's just a uh, bibble babble. It's just a CA, 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 CA. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't code for anything. It's just, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, at least for now, I think we think it's mostly just garbage in the cell. Although you never know about genomes, maybe in 20 years, we'll find out it's the most important thing in the world uh, for function of a, of a genome. But right now it's just considered stuff that doesn't evolve under selection because it doesn't code for a protein. So it just kind of sits there and, and in a clock-like way, it can evolve because uh, that neutral loci that don't code for anything, they tend to evolve via mutation stuff. So this one's, the, the way that we assess a, a microsatellite marker isn't by its sequence, because we know what its sequence is, it's CA, 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 but by its size, because the more or less fewer of those uh, repeats that you have, it tells you what size that is. And so you can run it out on a gel, and there's an example of that. Um, down below, that's just uh, like you, you put the actual DNA um, that's been uh, tagged with a fluorescent marker and you put that under a fluorescent right and you literally see these bands that tell you how heavy that snippet is, what tells, tells you how long it is. And so it's a really easy way to kind of find these genotypes. Um, and uh, another great thing about microsats is that you don't need a lot of DNA to use microsats. You can extract um, DNA from, from a tiny source and still get it from microsats, which is um, very convenient. And that's, this tends to evolve, um, again, it, neutral and it can evolve fairly quickly. So it's, it's a really great tool for seeing um, gene flow in contemporary populations and recent isolation of, of contemporary. Organ. And it can, it can be so tight that, you know, you can see differences between two, two lakes, you know, a mile apart. And then the kind of the, the, the hot new microsatellites were just kind of coming online 
when I got my job at BLM in 2008, they've been around for a little while. But um, as soon as I got the job, uh, I, I saw that, especially for leopard lizards, there were applications of microsats. And so I started funding and working on a lot of uh, several microsat projects, but that's the same for um, the, the kit box work we were doing is microsatellite based. And then a couple of years of that, and already this thing called uh, RADSEQ uh, showed up in the scene, which is uh, yet again, a, a kind of radically different way of getting at um, markers inside the genome that we can use to learn from, that we can, you know, sources of variation that we can leverage so we can tell individuals apart and tell populations apart, and tell species apart, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but just in case you don't, um, the way that um, RADSEQ works, the restriction site associated DNA is you use an enzyme um, to cut the DNA and it always, always cuts it the same six or eight uh, sequences, which, which can show up and you know, we have a huge genome. It's very possible to get um, six or eight um, letters in a row that are the same all over the, and, and there's reasons for that too. There's reasons that there's, there's restriction sites on the genome. But anyway, you use this enzyme and you cut the, the DNA up and then you're, what you do is you look for these, uh, what are represented as the little yellow bars in the uh, image, you look for, for variation. And so what we have is we have these things called SNPs, um, which vary. And we can tell as we look at these two populations that we have um, variation in, in, in these SNPs. So it's um, another, it just, you know, if, if you're using, you know, whether a lizard has a, a blunt head or a, or a, you know, or a long head, you know, that's a, a morphological trait, which means something. But with RAD, it's like you can generate a thousand uh, different traits from an individual lizard. So you can really be super informative um, about what's going out there in the world. So those were the three main markers that we've used so far for uh, leopard lizards. And of course, there's probably more new stuff coming down the pipe. I wanted, to, so that's, I, it's funny about, uh, you know, DNA, um, you know, you can learn things about animals, but what you've already heard in this talk is that you can use DNA as a tool. Um, it's a tool to get at things like, um, you know, important things that the, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute that are germane to wildlife biology. But the most important tool for a wildlife biologist in an agency who wants to do genetic work is to get really good partners. Um, I, when I first got the job and I was uh, at BLM, I was starting to do assistance agreements with you know, universities and geneticists. I remember my, my manager saying, well, you're, you're a hotshot geneticist. Can't you do all these things you know, right here in the office? And I started starting to think about, yeah, let's, let's set up the rear warehouse as a, a sterile genetics lab and I can buy you know, a million dollars of centrifuges and cyclers and all these good things. That's not really how, how it works. <laughs> yeah. um, and as far as your prioritization, when you get hired by the government, they like into a job, like I remember when I applied for my job, um, they said, you're gonna be working in a high power, high pass, you know, high paced environment where you're gonna need to set priorities. And so you do have to set priorities with your time. And as a wildlife biology for a land management area, my time is going to be maximized by being able to do the field work associated with uh, uh, DNA work um, because I have to be out there anyway. You know, you're out there doing your monitoring, you're out there just checking fences, whatever it is you, you do and the, the diverse tasks of a, of a on the ground wildlife biologist, you add to that, that visit, uh, I'm going to um, you know, catch a, a few of X and, and snip some tissue. Uh, a major source of tissue in many of these studies has been from roadkill animals. And so uh, given that BLM you know, biologists tend to drive a lot of roads getting out to our kind of disparate parcels, um, just picking up uh, roadkill things and getting them to partners has been a really powerful tool. And so here uh, we have um, Mark Statham, uh, Dr. Statham and my friend Mark is uh, with Ben Sachs lab at UC Davis. Um, I first got to know him because he and I were both in um, the same lab, actually, as postdocs in Kansas State, and uh, he's a you know, gifted fox uh, geneticist, but uh, he's since expanded to do uh, first giant kangaroo rats, and now he's doing leopard lizards, so uh, really just a great, um, great member of our, our team. And uh, in addition to brilliant scientists, you also need goofs, so here's, uh, <laughs> here's John and, and uh, 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 oh gosh, what's that guy's name? <laughs> Doug, no, actually joking. Uh, Dr. Um, Richmond and and, uh, and Wood, they um, are important geneticists in uh, uh, San Diego for the USGS Conservation Genetics Lab, um, and uh, talented people who really did an amazing job on our um, landscape genetic paper. Um, here we're handling uh, you know, leopard lizards as carefully as we can. 
Um, and we uh, really rely on USGS for not just uh, sampling, but for analysis. And then one of my most important partners isn't even human, it's Orby the dog, um, because we've used uh, scat detecting dogs for a lot of really important aspects of wildlife biology um, for long as leopard lizards. And uh, I've been working with uh, working dogs for conservation, uh, I think just about every year since uh, I got this job. Uh, and they've just been really important partners in doing genetic studies. So let's get straight to some of the things we've learned about uh, blunt nosed leopard lizards. Their population structure is something we've been able to, to adduce. So um, here's some things I'm sure you've seen a lot of, which are uh, uh, relatedness trees. The nice thing about this data set are that the trees were really well defined um, in, a, in a geographic sense. So in the lower um, left-hand corner, you can see there's a, a nice map, which I'll, I'll blow up for you. So we were able to, to actually um, segregate leopard lizards into very distinct clades spaced out over the floor of the San Joaquin Valley. And here's just another way to visualize data. These are called skyline plots or Manhattan plots, where you can see how you, you, you just find the color dot that you have up on the map, and you can come down and see how that population um, falls out. And again, just looking at the colors, you can tell we had kind of a nice result. We not only got kind of nice spacing of populations, but we learned that one population had gotten actually leaked across the San Joaquin Valley in the time when there was a land bridge between the two giant lakes between Tulare and Buena Vista. And this is a great example of genetics telling us something about these geographic uh, connectedness um, of the land in primordial times, as well as in, in modern times. And so that was a, a great result. Here's just a close up of that map. So we now know that we have a, a northern clade or northern group that's fairly distinct from the southern populations. The two southern groups form kind of one big group and then but we subdivide them into the, um, the western uh, hills population and the valley floor population. And this is really meaningful because it means when we uh, start to do captive breeding, if we start to fold other populations into our captive population, we know that we wanna be taking, if we want a, a northern clade population, we should be taking from other populations in the northern clade, not necessarily dipping into the Carrizo or the valley. So that was a really important thing I felt we, we, we learned about leopard lizards. You can also use genomes to actually estimate population size using genetic models. There's actually two ways to do that, but the intrinsic kind of internal way is to generate what they call um, effective uh, genetic population size, or you can call it NG or NE. And uh, so using these, these models, you can actually use those data from a few lizards to estimate what the entire population is looking like. So we learned this for a bunch of populations of leopard lizards, and we were actually able to estimate um, these numbers for the stand, it, it represents any, the, something close to the number of breeding females in a population. So really important stuff, especially when it came time to talking to the agencies about getting the captive breeding program going. We also genotype lizards from their scat, and that's where the working dogs came in. I'll give you one good field uh, recommendation for this, because, uh, you know, a lot of us are field biologists. When you collect scat, whether by dog or by uh, you, if you happen to see one, um, immediately try and get it into some desiccant. Like you can use those little packets that you get sometimes in packages where they're trying to have, have you know, dry environment inside the package. Um, there's also commercial desiccant. You can just put a teaspoon into the bag. But uh, one thing that Dr. Statham found was that scat that was preserved with a desiccant uh, sequenced way better than other stuff. So uh, going forward, it's really good to, you know, if, if you're going to possibly be picking up a poop and giving it to a colleague, uh, have, have some desiccant in your, your field biology kit. And here's just one example of uh, one thing that we, we found. We were able to genotype individual lizards and, and to species also. And we were able to actually um, look and, and see what the total per percentage of each kind of lizard was on the Pinochet Plateau. We also were able to do actual mark recapture. And I haven't gotten the, the data in visual form yet from Mark, but we were able to estimate um, by collecting scat on the ground and genotyping every scat, we found that lizards were repeatedly pooping and that those data actually can go into a mark recapture model because we were recapturing the poop. And it gave us really good population figures for the Pinochet Plateau that really um, were concordant with what we were seeing on the ground with, with visual surveys and other surveys. So a really kind of powerful way to, again, um, leverage um, the genes to tell us important things about these animals. And I just wanted to say the some of the primers that, uh, so primers are, um, a chemical that you, you, you put into um, a, a cycler uh, to do, uh, when you're doing the polymerase chain reaction, you, you, you need to kind of cut out these chunks of the genome, that, which is going to keep on replicating. 
And the primers are the little bookends on a sequence that you put down in order to, to open the double helix up that point. Um, so um, Mark actually used uh, some mitochondrial uh, markers when he was doing his species level assay. But to genotype lizards, he was actually using microsatellites developed, also developed by John. So um, I wanna, really want to make the point that you, you build up this knowledge base of genetics and it makes the next study easier because we get to stand on the shoulders of the people that worked before us. And the captive breeding program, what we're doing there is we've got every lizard genotyped so we know who's who and then we mate them. And then you can, and here's the outcome, which is a, a healthy, uh, so far the, the lizards we've hatched out this year are healthy uh, happening lizards. And here's an example of the data we get back. The, the dark green represent lizards that are most distantly related to each other. Um, and those are our number one priority lizards to, to mate. So those lizards that, that we get born out of the green cell pairings are gonna be the, you know, the healthiest genetically. And then all the other matings uh, show us lizards that are, are, are more closely related to each other. So this is really important. You know, this is kind of what we, what you call in traditional breeding, you call it a stud book. This is really important data so that we know that we can crisscross our, our animals and, and capitally breed them while maintaining genetic diversity. So um, having uh, gone straight into the breeding program, already having the tools to, to do this was really key for the capture breeding program to, to work as quickly as it did. And in the future, I'd like to see the, uh, the capture breeding program, if we could see it extended where we're repatriating spots where the lizards have gone extinct. Uh, so there's BLM plots, uh, both in the Colinga Nose and the Kittleman North Hills area around Kolinga and also um, in the Pleasant Valley reserves where it'd be great to try and repatriate uh, leopard lizards to those places. So uh, kind of a future um, uh, that we could go, uh, you know, with proper funding and, and uh, you know, if we have the, the will from the agencies to try and uh, actually fill in this big gap that we now have between, um, you know, the, the lower Kelman Hills and the, the Pinochi area. So um, that's going to be really a major application of genetics because we're going to need to uh, possibly hybridize lizards from different populations and then track, you know, their uh, unique alleles and, and make sure that we're getting, um, you know, proper rules that, that make sense. So uh, I see that my half hour is uh, up and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the people I've worked with in the agencies. Uh, so USGS uh, is John and, uh, John and Dustin and of course BLM has promoted me and I'm happy for their funding. Um, ben Sachs Lab, uh, you know, so it's mainly in ecology, but they're, they're number one right now uh, for me with, with leopard lizards uh, and, and scat. And a huge shout out to Working Dogs for Conservation, uh, who's the flip side, because you have to, you have to find the scat. <laughs> Somebody has to get it, and the dogs are, are the best at it. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, answering any of your questions, if you shouldn't have any. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, yeah, we'll open up the questions now. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the chat. So Stu Weiss, uh, first question we have, those NE numbers are in a dangerous range where genetic drift and inbreeding come into play. Any comments on this? We should be saving them all. I mean, right, yeah, those are terrible numbers. Uh, they're all a quasi-extension threshold. Um, there, there could be some uh, sampling artifacts where, you know, on the Elkhorn Plain, um, it seems like they're, they're, they're fairly abundant, but um, they could be fairly isolated from each other. But, um, you know, so that if we had sampled, um, you know, more lizards more densely from across the plane, we might have been getting, you know, more kind of a cumulative uh, NEs that, that add up to more lizards. Um, and there could be some kind of rare migration. They, I feel like that lizards that, that winked out from one portion would probably um, be replaced, there'd be recolonization from another part. But uh, that's still something we need to, to look into. But yeah, it's good. They, there's some... I feel like they're just dangerously at low um, density and, and in very constrained areas across their range. And we still don't know what's going on. You know, we don't, giant kangaroo rats, when they have a good year, they just blow across the landscape, but we've never really seen that happen with, with bloodless upper lizards. Uh, they get a little bit denser maybe for a few years and then they thin out, but they don't really kind of expand their ranges. And we don't know why that is. Yeah, in fact, Mike, would you mind going back to that slide real quick with the NE numbers? So we can kind of see it again. I would be Absolutely. curious just to see what it looks like. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just do this and we'll rack through it. Thanks for the patience. Boom. I think that's here at the end. Oh, I am. Okay, well, good. We can go backwards there. Yeah. Okay, let's go up to NEs. So, 
Yeah, so if you think about it closely, so again, these are, these are and Stu could probably tell me better than, tell you better than me, but th these are approximations of the number of breeding females. And so you know, if you can picture a population pyramid, you know, you're gonna have a number of uh, juvenile non-breeding uh, animals, then you have a number of uh, adult males. So uh, you might be able to, you know, in real time, you know, practice triple these numbers to get at what we're actually seeing for populations. Um, so, uh, but we feel like uh, this was sampled in the Pinochet Plateau back in uh, 2012. Um, and we felt like uh, uh, after we uh, had gone a few years of the drought, we were seeing many, many fewer uh, lizards and they, they weren't starting out in a good place to start out with. But, we can see those other places like Elkhorn clearly is, is up there. Some of the tropic we know is very dense as is Low Kern. And then the Silver Creek site, you know, seems to really be, be pumping. Yeah, I see that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, another question in the chat from Alex Eagleton. Would it be possible to breed individuals of different subregions to introduce new genes without risking outbreeding depression? Outbreeding depression. Yes, that's a really interesting uh, concept. Um, I think we all have a, a kind of a intuitive sense of what inbreeding depression is, which is um, Viltos alleles, like something you inherited from, um, you know, uh, this an ancestor that's recessive may, might never show up in your, you know, life. But if you happen to have, um, you know, that thing running down to you from two different ancestors and it ends up in you, it's homozygous, then you're sick. And the more closely we related everybody is to each other, the more likely you're going to get two, two, you know, mother, mother and father that both have that allele. So that's, and then you're sick. So that's inbreeding depression uh, in, in, you know, the very shortest form. Outbreeding depression is if genes um, are, are, genomes are incredibly complicated and all of, there's a potential across your genome for all these different loci, these different genes to be correlated with each other. And when you become really well adapted to a place, at the genomic level, you get the, these linkages and, and, and correlations among different genes. And what can happen is if you um, outbreed, if you take those from two different populations, that can get scrambled. And suddenly you don't have an animal. It's, it's not, you know, it, it, you don't get hybrid fitness. You get the opposite. You get an animal that can't exist in, in one place or the other or any place because you have this scrambling of, of these adaptive complexes at the genomic level. And I guess more, more simply, you know, if you just put it that, well, these, these two populations might be individually adapted to those conditions. Mm -hmm. And if you cross them, what, you know, it's like, what are they going to be adapted to now? It's like, what, what can they do? So um, the way that we avoid that is um, <laughs> we, we do the, the cross and we see how they turn out in the zoo and you put them on the ground and, and you see if they exist. And that's really all that you can really do. Um, the variation is diagnosable, but maybe not so extreme, and they don't really show up in extremely different environments. They seem to stick to a very um, kind of uh, well-defined desert environment. We're, we're not calling the San Joaquin Desert, um, which is, of course, one of the reasons they're, they're so endangered is they're, they're really restricted to those last strips of habitat. So we're not, I'm not too worried about seeing that kind of um, outbreeding depression happen uh, in our populations. And, and you know, we'll we're generating tons of lizards. So, um, you know, when we put them down the ground, uh, we'll be monitoring them really closely. Um, we're also looking at, um, or trying to, to think about what sites uh, are under selection in, in leopard lizards, what's recently evolved. So if we have some, some candidate sites, we might actually be able to see um, if, if there's adaptation going on. But at, within the Northern clade, I, I don't anticipate a lot of problems with out, outbreeding depression. Awesome, very good. All right, another question in the chat from uh, Kenneth uh, Gilliland. Uh, do you have any advice or informational recommendations for uh, someone getting started with RADSEC? Talk to people who do RADSEC. <laughs> uh, that's the best thing. You know, I took a, in grad school, I did take a molecular methods course. And so I, I'm sure there's courses out there you can take. Um, but again, this is the important of, uh, importance of, of partnering. Um, I would say uh, if you're in an agency and it's easy to do interagency work, uh, you can partner with people at, in the USGS Conservation Genetics Lab, but it's also being practiced in, in a, a ton of university labs. So, um, uh, you know, I think there's awful opportunities to um, get in on a study. Um, the, the lab work isn't so much the thing as the uh, computational analysis. 
And I remember a talk I attended by one of um, Brad Schaefer's students. Uh, I thought he, he showed a, a really good um, uh, analogy, which was, um, well, what do you get when you, when you get back the data from a, a RADSEQ study? And he showed a picture of a, a pile of, um, uh, uh, what's the word when you, um, you know, when you, when you put something, <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. And when you put a piece of paper in a machine and it shreds it, it was a bunch of shredded documents, like 20 feet tall. So you can just imagine this confetti in this giant haystack. And he said, that's what the data is like. And then you have to somehow put all that together. And so it's, you know, you have to use these um, fairly um, complex pipelines. You pipeline the data from your um, actual sequencing, and then you put that into a computer program and you have to write. It's, it's fairly challenging computationally. The, the lab work is, is, is not that hard. So go find yourself somebody that, that does it in their lab uh, or, uh, or see if you can find a, a class. I'm sure that there's, been, there's some classes being taught. Awesome, thanks Mike. Got that Kenneth? Good, good stuff. Um, all right, another question from Stu Weiss. With the sample sizes, it looks possible to look at uh, functional genetics at key uh, loci, so, i.e. selection for thermal, thermal performance, heterosis, et cetera. I think Mike just dropped off, but we'll give it a minute, see if we can, if we can come back in. So no worries. Yeah, that was a really great talk. A lot of good genetics. All right. Mike, you back on? Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. All right. Did you catch that last question? Sorry what about that. Could, you, could you repeat it? There's a question from Stu, right? Yeah, from Stu. Yeah. Bye, right, bye Stu. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Cool. All right. Well, Stu, Stu says, uh, with the sample sizes, it looks possible to look at functional genetics at key loci, i.e. selection for thermal performance, heterosis, et cetera. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy you asked that question because uh, I, I went there a little bit in my last answer, which was, uh, yes, we, we would like to look at uh, area under selection functional sites. Um, we did that for with Mark Statham uh, for our giant cancer study, and he actually found some sites that, that were under selection. And, you, you know, it, in a genome, what you can do is um, you can use the same uh, tools that we use for population genetics, where you can look at um, the, the subdivision within a species, and we use these uh, measures called FST. And you can do that within a genome to see if there are any outliers that are, that are so different from each other that a selection, selective sweep uh, had to have happened at locus. So we've done that, and that's a, an approach we can absolutely take. And the, the kinds of selection that uh, Stu's really familiar with that, that I, I'm wondering at would be, of course, uh, selection for um, aridity because that changes uh, in multiple directions in the San Joaquin Valley. And I'd love to see the signature of whether Lentless Leopard Lizards adapted to non-native grass when it was introduced in uh, the, the 1750s or whenever it came in, because I'm convinced that there are, um, you know, there's the potential for, for adaptive syndromes between bluntless leopard lizards and, and these non-natives. Um, and that's important because if we start proposing to completely wipe out the non-native grasses, we, we might learn to our dismay that leopard lizards are actually uh, somewhat adapted to them. They might need non-native grasses to generate the high volume of grasshoppers they, they appear to eat, which is different from uh, the long-nosed leopard lizard because long-nosed leopard lizards uh, eat other lizards, but you know, Gambelia sela eats grasshoppers. So, hey, Stu. Hey. Yeah, awesome, good stuff. Uh, another question from the chat from Pedro Garcia. On the note of genetics, has anyone heard of updates regarding the protection of hybrid blunt nose versus long nose in the Cayuma River Valley it was uh, mentioned in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife five-year review in 2020. Yeah, so uh, that's a huge issue for us, actually. And uh, so in Richmond at all, um, and I'll go back to that page so you can see that citation. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do this one more time. Um, that explicitly addresses a hybrid issue. It's a big part of that paper. And so um, and the neatest thing is that we looked at the different uh, those different markers that I discussed. All three of those got employed in the paper. Um, and they... Uh, gave us um, kind of a picture of what was going on. And let's just go back to um, that um, slide here. So I'm going to go to the, um, 
just so you can see the citation. Lifting it lets me do it. Do 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 do. Okay, so this right here is the citation. So in Richmond, uh, at all, uh, 2017, the persistence of historical population structure, um, we address that. So we we find that anciently um, there uh, we, we find that there was fairly recent um, transmission of of uh, male alleles um, uh, up and down the Cuyama River, but we also found that there was ancient an ancient uh, hybridization event between long-nosed leopard lizards and blunt-nosed leopard lizards. And Montanucci had theorized, you know, he had looked at their morphology and, and inferred there's hybridization going on in the Kiyama, but we were able to show that at the, um, uh, at the molecular level. And Montanucci's uh, hypothesis was that this was a stable hybrid population, which means there was a one-time hybridization event that kind of creates another different new population, a, a true mix. And we found some evidence to suggest that this was actually the case, that we had this uh, I mean, it's a crazy landscape down there because basically you have blunt nosed leopard lizards up near the top the, where, you know, the Kaima Valley goes north, south, and then it jogs, you know, westward when it hits the, the Caliente range. So right up in the north, you have fairly pure blunt nosed leopard lizards. As you work south, they become more and more long nosed. And then as you go eastwards up those big creeks, so if you go up Apache Creek or Ballinger or Catal or Dry Creek, you get up into the Kayama Highlands or Badlands right before you hit the grapevine. And at the top, it's long-nosed leopard lizards. And you, you just look, I mean, it wouldn't be, take much for a long-nosed leopard lizard to just walk down you know, the road and eventually be mating with a blunt-nosed leopard lizard. So um, in the Pinochi Hills, uh, the Pinochi population is about 1,200 feet and the little Pinochi population is about 1,000 feet down. It's only about, it's less than a mile to travel between the two populations. And it's not very rough country and yet they've been genetically isolated for a long time which kind of feeds into this um, uh, observation that leopard lizards just don't seem to Hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, I think so. I, you uh, broke up at the end a little bit, so, um, but it was only last five or 10 seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. All right. If anyone else have any more questions, please throw them in the chat or pre, yeah, uh, feel free to raise your hand too. You can talk to Mike directly. So got multiple options. And you're you're always uh, welcome to uh, email me also at just uh, care of BLM. So. I have a quick question for the uh, the blunt nose that you um, you guys are breeding in the in the program and you release. Are you tracking each one individually? But um, are, you, are you tracking them? Uh, or you mean uh, ones that you like yeah. we haven't we haven't released any yet. Okay, right. But when they when they do, yeah when they do get released, yes, we are going to track every single one. That's because um, we're hoping to learn uh, a lot from the the animals we release. Um, and you know, we we don't want any of them to to, um, to die. But you know, if if there's some issue that's you know we don't know quite yet what the reason is why they're going down. So you know, if they if they don't stick to the land. Uh, well, we might learn a lot about why they're going into decline. Awesome, good stuff. Yeah, any more questions, anybody? We have a little bit more time left in our in our uh, hour window, but um, yeah, this has been a great a great talk. Thanks, Mike. And, no, you're welcome. Yeah, very informative. So, yeah. Okay, are we signing off? <laughs> sure. I uh, actually, can you go back? To, I I have a one request. There's a, a photo of one of the uh, the little blunt nose that had a uh, a nice little uh, smile on it. It was kind of a cool photo. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, these lizards will eventually, um, they're, they're, they are 
figuring out some kind of display that they can do. Um, and basically, oh, by the way, I, I want to say, uh, I can't say one thing that's interesting. This lizard that we um, made in captivity, uh, go back to that picture. Um, this male was born in the fall of last year uh, in the zoo. So this is actually the first zoo born lizard to mate and he's mated with um, one of the other females, obviously not his mom. Um, so this is the, the first time that we've had a breeding of one of our lab born lizards with another leopard lizard. So um, really excited to hear that. It seems like uh, they're uh, robust in captivity. So we'll be able to use our, our F1 generations um, and be able to do a little back crossing and the whole idea being to increase their genetic diversity as much as we can. So, um, but let me go forward to that. And I don't know if this is the same lizard or not, but uh, it is not the cute lizard. So let's go pick that up. There he is. We have not given any of the names as far as I know. I have a, I have a question about the um, individual recognition when you guys yes. are using the dog. So you know, like you could tell yeah. that each scat was like, or you could link it to one single lizard. We needed to use the genetic methods to do that because, uh, I'm sorry, are you done with your question? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess I, I was just, um, I was just um, it, like, I worked with kangaroo rats and I feel like it would be pretty hard to like say that it wasn't, you know, siblings or you'd have to have like a lot of genetic information. You're saying you're doing, you're doing genetic work with kangaroo rats? No, I, I mean, I was just saying like, I was surprised that from, that you would have enough information, I guess, to do it, that they were so differentiated that you could really tell the different oh, yeah. individuals from well, this guy. <clears throat> If, and if you if if you all do ancestry and me or uh, com or uh, you know train three and me, um, you know we all know that we can use uh, genetic markers to tell uh, you know not only tell us part as, as individuals but to see relatedness you know within families you know you can um, it's, it's quite remarkable. So now there's um, uh, again at the Pinochet Plateau, um, even though they're highly inbred, you know we we were still able to, to genotype individuals. So. Um, yeah, the, the data are there. It's, um, you know, we get, especially with, with, with Microsas, especially with RADSeq, you get a lot of data and that, um, you know, e each of us is an individual and that's determined by our having, you know, really nicely scrambled genomes of generations. So you, you can tell them apart. And it's, it's okay. mind blowing that, that we're able to get in a scat. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I was also similarly, have you done like eDNA stuff with them? Or is it just really so obvious when they're in the land? Yeah, so I mean, uh, doing eDNA for blunt-nosed leopard lizards, I guess would kind of be like if you deployed like vacuum cleaners that sucked up all you know a lot of sand in an area and then just ran all that, which you can do, and people are doing stuff like that. Our our mm -hmm. method when we use SCAT, that's um, a form of eDNA because it's not you know we haven't taken the scissors and lopped off a little bit of the tail, which is what we do when we take direct tissue. It's something the lizard has left in the environment. So it's it's literally environmental DNA. It's just a special category of, of scat. Um, and uh, I wanted to make a point that microsatellites, even though they're the old thing, um, they're gonna work better for uh, genotyping scats than um, RADSeq right now, because RADSeq is fairly hungry for DNA. You know, you want a lot of tissue to start out with when you do RADSeq. So, it doesn't really work that well when you're trying to when you use DNA that's been extracted from scat because you're not getting a lot of DNA out of scat and it's amazing what they can do with what they can get out of it. Cool, thanks. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, thank you all for the great questions and the great dialogue. Um, yeah, if uh, anyone has any any other questions, please uh, chime in now. Um, and if not, we can. Uh, we can wrap it up, but um, yeah, I want to say thank you, Mike, for for being our speaker um, tonight. And uh, the captive breeding program has been an exciting thing, and we're looking forward to you know, moving forward and happening. You know, but uh, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the invite, and thanks for coming and the great questions. Yeah.
I agree. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for all the participants and all the questions, too.